That's fine. Thank you, Tom. Um, right. Well, um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm glad Tom's managed to sort these gremlins for now, at least. And uh, fingers crossed that everything goes smoothly from here on in. This evening, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome to speak to both members of the Edinburgh Jolsonk and the Mining Institute of Scotland, um, uh, Jessica Smith. Now, I first met Jessica, I think, on uh, uh, road section at the Sloch on the A9, looking at um, various uh, challenges in uh, some of the early work in, in how the uh, A9 might be uh, jeweled along its length and restructured in places. And um, that reminded me that, that um, in coming up with the program for this year's uh, lectures, that it would be good perhaps to hear something about the role of uh, the geologist, the engineering geologist um, in infrastructure development and, and particularly robust and resilient uh, infrastructure development in a modern Scotland, um, in where we want to be in the 21st century. And uh, as luck would have it, I, I've uh, had some more contact with Jessica quite recently on uh, some other work, which I think she's probably going to refer to this evening in her lecture. Jessica is um, uh, secretary to the Central Scotland. I'm looking at my other screen, Jessica, just to get the, the words right here. Central Scotland Regional Group of the London Jaws. So, um, and she has a particular interest in um, STEM subject research and the role of uh, women in geosciences. And that is one of our particular roles in the Geological Society of London. So I think for all those reasons, I think it's, it, it's very appropriate that we have uh, Jessica come and talk to us this evening. Uh, and so I'm simply gonna hand over to Jessica, who's going to talk about infrastructure delivery and the role of the, I suppose, engineering geologist really. So yeah. thank you, Jessica, carry on. Thank you so much, Graeme. Now, bear with me, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. But first of all, thank you very much for joining tonight. What a great turnout there seems to be. And, and thank you very much for uh, listening to me witter on for a little while. Um, Graeme made it sound like I hung about in roadsides a bit too much, and that, that might actually be true based on the work I've been doing the past few years. Um, so yes, thank you again. It's, it's lovely to be speaking to you. I only wish that um, we were able to meet in person, but I'm sure Zoom will do a great job for us tonight. So as Graeme said, my name is Jessica Smith and I'm an engineering geologist. I work for Atkins based in Glasgow and I'm also um, vice president of one of the other geological societies. So I'm vice president of the Geological Society of London. My tenure will end next year. So I'm looking out for an exciting new challenge to take on after that. Now, today I'm going to give a little whiz through um, a few slides on what engineering geology is. I'm going to touch upon a couple of major infrastructure projects in Scotland, the A9 Dueling and Corry Glass. And in, in, along the lines of the theme of, of geoscience and society, I'm going to take a look at diversity in geoscience and engineering, and then have a little bit of a think about you know, how we can go about creating and inspiring the next generation of geoscientists. So, what is engineering geology? My background is I've got a, a bachelor's from the University of Glasgow, which is in earth science. I worked for a couple of years in geo-environmental geotechnical consultancy, and I subsequently did an MSc in engineering geology at Imperial College in London. And I always call my MSc a conversion course. It has allowed me to speak the language of engineers because believe me, we do speak quite different languages at times. Now, I quite like this little snippet in terms of what engineering geology is all about um, and the role that we have in civil engineering. So you can imagine this, this encompasses a broad range of projects and in Scotland, a broad range of geologies as well. The engineering geologists will use a lot of our core um, geological skills and apply them in the civil engineering context. So we are able to, we bring the deep time thinking ability to projects we're able to understand the land, you know, when we look at the land, we get more from the landscape than many other disciplines would do. And we know how to ask the right questions of the ground as well, moving forwards. And I've included communication on this slide as well, because I actually think in my experience, geoscientists do tend to be very good communicators and able to communicate quite complex matters to people, lay people as well. 
Now, when we look at Scotland, there's a lot happening on the infrastructure side of things, and a lot has happened in the past decade or so. This is really just a flavour of the range of projects which have been completed or are underway in Scotland. And each and every one, um, engineering geology has been fundamental to the success of the project. Now, something like Loch Catron Aqueducts, that's a refurbishment scheme of Victorian aqueducts, which include unlined tunnels. Um, and that's more about the performance of the rock in the longer term, going in, doing inspections, understanding how the material is performing over time and what we might need to do to keep on supporting um, that particular asset in its performance. Whereas if you look at something like Beatrice Offshore Wind Farm, that's quite a different setting altogether and quite different skills and technologies are applied in developing ground models there so that we can take forward construction and de-risk that type of project, especially a project on that kind of scale. So there's a lot going on. We're doing it in a lot of different geographies, a lot of different geologies. We're doing it in right in city centre, such as Edinburgh there. Um, all of these projects interact with the ground, and that means that the engineering geologist is critical to them. Now, I'm going to touch upon two projects, as I mentioned in the contents earlier. And the first one is the A9 dueling. I'm sure that many of you um, are familiar with the A9 and have traveled north along it multiple times. You might even be lucky enough to have hung about by a roadside cutting with Graham and I in the past, who can say? Um, but this is one of Scotland's largest infrastructure projects. We're talking about upgrading 80 miles of road from single carriageway to dual carriageway. And really we're looking at around about a three billion pound project. It's a huge public money investment for this scheme. A little bit of an overview here about the A9. Now there's some fundamental goals of the A9 dueling. It's all about helping to reduce journey times and improve that journey time reliability, reduce driver frustration and reduce accident severity. Also it's about um, increasing connectivity to um, public transport, to cycle networks as well. So there's a lot going on and a lot being delivered for the communities along the, the length of the A9. Um, I'm sure that if you have driven along it, some of these points will resonate with you as they do with me. I grew up between Aberdeen and Inverness, so the A9 is a road that I'm familiar with, and it's a project that I, I, I do believe needs to be done. Now, the image on the right-hand side of the screen, that sets out the different schemes which form the A9 dueling, and these are all at different stages. So a couple of them have been constructed, King Craig to Dalradi, and also down at the bottom, Lunkerty to Burnham. They're now open, they have been dueled, and Tomatin to Moy is out for tender right now, so that will be the next to reach construction. But the other schemes are at different stages of design development and going through the statutory process before we can actually hit the ground and start to undertake the work. And many of these schemes actually pass through really quite dramatic landscape and the Cairngorms National Park. So on this little slide here, I just wanted to convey a little bit about the sense of the landscape that we're passing through. So I'll just use my laser pointer here. Now the A9 travels up from Perth, or this stretch of the A9 I should say, Perth all the way up to Inverness, and it's passing through quite rugged, quite mountainous terrain in places. And the corridor itself is sort of weaving through mountain passes, exploiting breaks in the landscape. And, and this, is, this is basically a legacy of the historical routes through these mountains. So drovers passes, military roads, for example. And it's not just the A9 that exploit these breaks. The Highland Mainline Railway similarly tails alongside the A9 through much of that journey there. So it's a, an interesting weaving, winding route through some quite dramatic landscapes and quite dramatic terrains in Scotland. Now, this image here where we're looking at the elevations actually gives us a sense of the geology through this part of Scotland as well. And if I scoot onto this slide here, it's just a really high level overview of the bedrock geology in this part of Scotland. And in very broad terms, we are passing from Perth, where we're largely in, let's say, sedimentary rocks. We're crossing the Highland Boundary Fault, so a major break in our landscape. And we're getting into these metamorphic rocks, complex geologies, igneous intrusions as well. So the A9, you know, are over a relatively short length. We're passing through quite varied and quite different landscapes and quite different geologies. So that's, of course, interesting. And that poses lots of different challenges for the engineering geologists in terms of how we go about investigating the engineering geology and what that means for the design as well. Now, very often I find that when people think about geoscience or geology, they think about rock primarily. I think that, you know, fossils, it's what people see, it's what they associate with um, geologists. 
but actually a lot of the work of an engineering geologist is in the uppermost meters of deposits. So we're largely in superficial deposits. So through much of the A9 scheme, we're actually dealing with glacial deposits. We're dealing with peat. We're understanding the extents of these deposits, the thicknesses of these deposits, and what they mean for the design moving forwards. And this is something that I, um, this is my personal plea here. An engineering geologist can do a great job in understanding a lot of this. An engineering geomorphologist can very often do a much better job. And that's something that as a sector, engineering geologists, we work with geotechnical engineers, we work with hydrogeologists, and a little bit lagging behind is the role of the geomorphologist in all of this. I'm proud to say that in Atkins, we do have a few and the numbers are growing. But for me, that's something that as an industry, we need to be seeking to improve and work more closely with our, our cousins in physical geography as well. Now, if I take a step back again, we look at this screen here, we've got the different schemes that I mentioned. There's a couple of schemes that over the past few years I've been involved with through the atkins Michelle joint venture, and that's up in the northern section. So project 11, which is Dalradi to Slocht, so around about Aviemore, and then project 12, which is Tomat and Tomoy, so that little bit further north creeping up into Inverness. Now, Dalradi to Slocht, it's entirely within the Cairngorms National Park, so you can imagine there's a lot of sensitivities through that route there. And this is the single longest stretch to be upgraded out of all of the A9. Now that stretch does include one particular pinch point, which is a pinch point in project 11, but more generally it is one of the key pinch points across the A9 overall. And again, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with the stretch right at the north of Dalradi to Slocht and it's Slocht itself. Now this is an area which is characterized by really quite complex geology that Graham could talk at length about, I'm quite sure, and do a much better job of than me. But if we keep things to a fairly fundamental level, we're talking about um, highly deformed, highly fractured rock. It's metamorphic material by and large, a lot of nisosity, magmatism. Um, it's a bit of a mixed bag, actually, by and large, in this area here, because it's been so highly disturbed. Um, we do have a number of rock cuttings in this area, one of which is in the photo and there's a section there below it. And a number of these are actually quite unstable and measures have had to be taken because they've been formed at angles that really don't work for the structure of the rock mass. They've been degrading or performing poorly over time, it would be fair to say. And this is also an interesting area in terms of, I've mentioned the Cairngorms National Park, when we think about constraints, this rock cutting and a wider area, which would be kind of um, behind me on the screen, if you like, forms part of a geological conservation review site. So this, whilst it's not a triple SI yet, it has to be treated as if it were a triple SI when we look at the design and take that forwards. So there's a lot going on, on at Slocht and it gets even more complicated when you stand on the ground. And it gets complicated because of the other infrastructure that's in and around the area here. So this is probably the key pinch point that we have. We've got the A9 as it stands right now on the left hand side of the screen and on the right hand side is the Highland Main Line, which at this point here is single track, it's going into a rock cutting itself. In between the two you can see a, a patch of a tarmac along there and that's the National Cycle Network Route 7, formerly the old A9 that stretch there. So there's just a lot going on in terms of um, mixed use different uh, requirements for the landscape here as well and, and needing to keep all these different stakeholders engaged and fully appraised of what's going on. Now I really like this photo because for me it just sets the scene for Slocht, it sets the scene for those challenges. So right now in terms of the anthropogenic aspects there's, there are many many things we need to deal with there, fundamentally the railway line and the proximity to that. Now widening for the Dal Rally to Slough scheme is primarily southbound widening. What that means here is it will be pushing into the hillside on the left hand side of the screen. So where we've got the rock cutting, which is now covered in mesh, we will be widening by creating a new cutting further back there. So even looking at the width of the road, I think you can get a sense for the scale of the work that will be required through here. Now the engineering geologist on a scheme like this, we're really all about understanding the ground, and understanding the implications of the ground for the design. So even if we are stood right here, we can learn a lot about the landscape. We can look into the distance. We've got some steep topography, steep long hillsides trailing up the way. We've got some natural rock slopes, which are in this area here. If you were to walk down the road, you would see there's a lot of natural instability in those rock slopes. They have been naturally oversteepened. 
we've got the engineered slopes here and also in the railway line. Each of those have had to be, um, the road and the railway have had to be protected by the use of mesh to prevent material that fails reaching the road. And you can also see there's a mantling of superficial deposits here as well. We've got heathy scrub growing, there's superficial stuff of interest also. So the engineering geologist, initially, you can stand there and start to build up your conceptual ground model. What are the things we're going to be worried about? What are the things we don't know? And what are the things we want to ask about the ground? And one of the things which I'm sure a lot of people will have some understanding of, um, one of the ways in which we ask questions of the ground is to do an intrusive ground investigation. So this can take all sorts of different forms. It could be drilling boreholes. We have some core which has been recovered here. It could be digging trenches, digging trial pits all manner of things you can do testing in situ as well. It's all about tailoring your methods to suit what you're trying to understand in those ground conditions. Now this core box here, I think that that's probably not all that unexpected. We're looking at, a, if I go back the way, an area with a lot of rock outcropping. So yeah, you'd kind of expect probably some quite good recovery, decent recovery of core, perhaps not too many surprises. Your hypothesis has maybe been tested and you're able to check it off. But not very far from that borehole, another one was not yet countering rock until a much greater depth. So whilst we can understand the landscape and um, understand what to expect based on that, we do still unearth surprises. And that's one of the fun things about engineering geology. We're always um, contributing to our learning and, and developing a greater understanding of the ground. And this means that we have our wits about us when we prepare the design, when we try to push things forward for the road development. It also means that we can, we've got a feedback mechanism to our ground model, or conceptual one, as it becomes observational with all these boreholes and exploratory holes that we dot about the lands landscape. And we can start to do a further iteration of testing those and refining the ground model also. Now, I would classify something like a borehole as a pretty traditional means of investigating the ground. It can be a little bit um, rough and ready, but we get a huge amount of useful information, both about the um, soils and the rock encountered and also the hydrogeology as well. So an incredibly valuable part of what we do. But actually, ground investigation, I would argue these days, encompasses much more techniques and more modern techniques as well. So this is um, a LIDAR scan, which was carried out at Slough a number of years ago now, and I have, I have to confess, I've used it in a few presentations, but it's just a lovely, lovely visual. And it's important for me because actually when we capture LIDAR, we can use it for a lot of um, bread and butter work of the engineering geologists. You can do mapping, for example, from LIDAR. We've also used our LIDAR data set to take discontinuity measurements on a number of cuttings as well. So that's all about um, keeping our workforce safe. We don't need to dangle off of ropes or stand by the roadside when we can use the LIDAR data to, to, collect, to collect our information. And also there's benefits there because if someone else does that initial work, I can easily go in and check and review that work as well. So we can get a second opinion on things. Whereas out in the field, you may be out in the cold, the wind and rain, you take some measurements, you perhaps haven't always quite accurately recorded where you are. It's difficult to go back to that same point. And also I would argue that the use of something like LIDAR really starts to, to widen the pool of people who can get involved in geoscience and get involved in projects like this. Um, Another important point as well is that the project by nature of what we're doing means that we will be removing material, we will be changing the face of the A9 through Slocht, however we've now preserved Slocht. I've got Slocht in my laptop here effectively and we can use that in the future to retrospectively do some work. We can, um, it forms part of a geodiversity plan to keep Slocht if you like, albeit in digital form and for me that's an element of geoconservation as well because you know, with the best will in the world, we can't retain things exactly as they are. And indeed, we may not want to, but we've preserved it for future use, should that be of interest. So the A9, that's been a little bit of a whistle-stop tour to Slocht. Um, but really, I've tried to highlight that the engineering geologist is fundamentally critical to a project like this. Like I say, we're working across the A9 in really varied geologies. Um, we can throw up surprises in ground conditions and that's the importance of doing ground investigation and of having that ground model and testing it. And ultimately, we are working to de-risk the project moving forward. So if we didn't have that good sound understanding of the ground, 
we could be in a bit of a pickle further down the line when we reach construction. And keep in mind that during construction, both the A9 and the Highland Main Line will remain operational. So you really don't want to be hitting programme delays because of unforeseen ground conditions, for example. Now I'm going to take a move to another project now, which is Corrie Glass Pump Storage Hydro Scheme. I'm currently seconded into SSE for this project, um, which is why I'm talking about it to you today. And the energy sector, I think, is an interesting one because there are a lot of challenges in achieving net zero moving forwards. We're going to see an increased demand for electricity due to electrification of transport, heat at home, um, industry as well. And with a, a reduced use of fossil fuels, we need to mix to move to a mixture of low carbon options. Now, we're very fortunate in Scotland. We've actually got some really great low carbon resources. Um, but they are weather dependent, some of them. So I'm thinking of uh, wind farms, for example. So the UK electricity network really needs to start to adapt in order to meet this decarbonisation challenge. And quarry glass is one of the ways in which the network can adapt moving forward. So I'm aware that everybody may not be familiar with pump storage. So a little bit of an introduction to this. And um, then we can move on to talk a little bit more about quarry glass itself. The pump storage is a, a means of storing and flexibly providing reliable electricity over an extended period of time. So that's a, a bit of a mouthful there. Now, some of the key things to bear in mind are once developed, it's actually quite a, a low cost method to maintain. It's got a long operating life. And really, fundamentally, we're looking at two bodies of water, an upper reservoir and a lower reservoir. And they're at different heights, as you can see there. At times of low demand or where there's surplus generation elsewhere in the grid, you can use that excess energy to pump water up to your upper reservoir and you're storing that energy there. It's effectively a big battery that you then have up in your hillside. At times of high demand or when other generation is perhaps low, so other variable generation, solar, wind, for example, you can release that energy um, by using the water to generate hydroelectricity in the power plant there. And this is actually, um, pump storage is a, a really, has a really fast response time. So it helps to improve grid stability because if you get something where you, something drops out, for example, in a matter of seconds, you can be up and running and generating your electricity using that storage, using your battery in the upper reservoir. At Corrie Glass, um, our lower reservoir is Loch Lochy and our upper reservoir is yet to be created, but it will be over 500 meters above Loch Lochy. And it's got a capacity of up to 1500 megawatts. Well, what, what does that mean in real terms? What that means is enough capacity to power 3 million homes for periods of up to 24 hours. So that's pretty vast, actually. And once Corrie Glass is constructed, it would double Great Britain's existing electricity storage capacity. Now, this is the first large scale pump storage scheme to be developed in Great Britain for over 30 years. So it's, it's a pretty immense project, to be honest, all things considered. And where is Corrie Glass if you're not too familiar with Loch Lochy? So on this little map here, it's a bit of scene setting in terms of where we are in the world. And this uh, red squiggly shape is the area that's being consented planning permission. Um, so that's the Corrie Glass site itself. Those of you who are eagle-eyed or know the area well will immediately recognise we are in the Great Glen. Now, I'm going to go back to this image here because I think it sets out quite nicely in terms of the Great Glen. This is a, one of Scotland's kind of um, most well-known geographical features, I would argue, it's over 100 kilometres long. You can see it quite clearly on the scheme here. It's kind of cutting a path through here, Inverness, down towards Fort William there. And it's a really major feature in our landscape. In terms of, of how it was formed, we have um, a really prominent fault. So again, this is a geological map, bedrock. So this is the fault we're talking about here. And it's got a really long history of reactivation, um, predominantly strike slip movement, um, but a bit of a mixture of what's going on generally. And it originated 430 to 390 million years ago. So that's the, the, the bedrock feature there. Now the actual Great Glen itself has also been carved out through glacial action. So we've got our lovely deep lochs, the beautiful glens, and that's a, a result of the glaciers over 10,000 years ago. 
So the geology, much like the A9, is complex, it's mixed, there's a very long history in terms of what's imprinted one on top of the other, and we need to start to unpick all of this to understand it for a glass itself. Taking a look at the Corrie glass scheme, um, kind of at an overview level, in terms of what we're going to have will be this new reservoir, which will be formed up behind the hillside here, and that means that a dam will also be constructed. And another key element will be the cavern, which will house the powerhouse. And connecting the two will be tunnels, and we'll have a series of tunnels as well down here towards Loch Lochie. But that's not all of it. We've got a series of traps as well. It's quite a remote rural location, so we need to think about how we practically get into these locations and how we service those locations during operation as well. So it's a, like I say, it's, it's quite a, a feat of engineering that's planned. And let's just think a little bit more about where we're planning that feat of engineering. So I've just zoomed in on the, the bedrock geology and I'm, I'm grossly simplifying things here. I'm really just pointing out the upper Gary Samite formation. So let's say that's our competent rock or more competent rock. And we've got the Great Glen Fault Zone over here. So that's our cataclastic material, which could be highly mixed. We could have areas where it's much stronger, um, areas where we're, we're effectively working with, with mush to all intents and purposes. And we also have pretty major um, fault boundaries here. This is the edge of the Great Glen Fault Zone before we transition into the Upper Gary Samite Formation. And I'm sure I don't need to say this here, but of course, faults on the screen as we see them are an, a representation. A fault in real life will be much more complex than a line on a page or a line on a screen. And this little red hatched box here highlights the general zone in which we will be undertaking underground works for Corrie Glass. So you'll notice we're transitioning between this area, the Great Glen Fault Zone, this cataclastic material, this highly mixed, highly potentially degraded material, and areas here of the much more competent and really quite different um, Samite as well. And in order to understand more about the geology, we obviously need to undertake some quite you know, serious GI campaigns and do some mapping as well. We're fortunate BGS have been out on site along with SSE's consultants, Stantec and Covey, and they've undertaken um, a decent amount of mapping on the hillside. There's good exposure there, so that, that's of benefit to the project. At present, we've got a very small ground investigation on the ground, and that's actually focused on the access track coming into the site from over here. So it's really all about um, road design more than anything. But looking forward, so there's some quite exciting things that, which will happen at Corrie Glass in terms of both um, a much larger GI, which will need to access the Corrie itself, so accessing quite challenging terrain. And there will also be an exploratory adit, which will be up to a kilometre in length into the hillside from Loch Lochy. So all of this is in the name of better understanding the geology, better understanding the engineering geology, and taking those findings and using them in the design of the scheme. So really, it, it's a, a fabulous example of what we can do and what we can learn on a project like this. And actually, a project like Cory Glass has great opportunities to advance scientific learning as well in a location like this. How often do you extend a one kilometer long hillside, a long, one kilometer long and add it into a hillside starting in the Great Glen Fault Zone? Not terribly often. So more broadly, infrastructure projects such as Cory Glass can contribute a lot to scientific development and scientific learning. So that's a, a, another real positive. Now I've really focused, um, again, albeit at quite a high level on the bedrock at Cory Glass. For obvious reasons, we're excavating tunnels and caverns, but that's not the end of the story at Cory Glass. This photo is taken um, up in the high ground, looking in towards what will be the reservoir area. And again, we can start to think about, well, what might be some of the challenges that the engineering geologist needs to understand here? I'm looking at quite steep mountainous terrain. Could there be some natural slope instability, for example, here? It looks like it's upland Scotland. There's probably some peat kicking about also. So what do we need to understand about that? How do we deal with that? So please don't just think only about the underground elements. There's a, a large scale infrastructure development happening up in the quarry itself, the reservoir and the dam. And so the engineering geologist needs to understand these shallower conditions as well. It's an absolutely fabulous um, project. There's no, no two ways about it. And in many ways, it's um, 
an engineering geologist's dream, I would say. We've got complex geology and we've got complex engineering as well. And it's contributing towards net zero. So we've got, we've got a bit of a feel good factor also in that respect. But what I would ask is, you know, looking forwards, are we going to have the engineering geologists of the future? Will we have that resource pool available to us? And what are the barriers? And I'd like to just touch upon diversity now in geoscience and engineering. Now, actually, I would like you, first of all, to have a little bit of a think about your geoscience colleagues, maybe the people you teach in the geosciences, the people who taught you about geoscience, um, the members of the groups tonight, for example. Do you see any particular similarities in people? You know, are, are we all very different? Are we from similar backgrounds? I think it's something to always have in the back of your mind when we're working as a group together. And I think that if we're honest with ourselves, we would see a great many similarities and potentially not as much diversity as we might like to see in some of these groups. And that's a simple fact. I think it is true if we look around, for example, uptake of geoscience subjects, it's predominantly a very white subject. It's an able-bodied subject. So these are challenges that we probably need to start thinking about overcoming because we want to have the best possible talent pool moving into the geosciences and working on the Cory Glass sites of the future as well. Now, this is a bit of a stark fact. Women make up 14.5% of all engineers. I don't think I need to remind you about the population split in terms of gender. Now, my experience has shown actually that in geosciences, the, the gender balance tends to be better than it is in engineering. Um, in my career working in ground engineering teams, which again are a mixture of geotechnical engineers and engineering geologists by and large, it tends to be that the, the gender balance is boosted by the engineering geologists. It's just, there's more women doing geology and more women going into geoscience subjects after geoscience careers after studying them at university. But that's a stark fact. And it's one that you know is troubling, is worrying, because we're missing out on people in these subjects. Now, in this slide, um, I'm pointing out that 69% of UN member states criminalise conceptual same-sex activity. So you might be thinking, well, what's important about that? If you are an LGBTQ plus geoscientist, this means that there are some parts of the world where you may really benefit from doing some fieldwork, for example, but it's not a safe place for you to go. You're restricted. Um, and even if you were to try and get a job somewhere, go to work in a site, a quarry glass elsewhere in the world, there are some countries where somebody who openly identifies as LGBTQ plus would not feel comfortable going. So we need to think about that as well. We need to be a home for everybody. One in five people in the UK are disabled, so that includes visible and non-visible disabilities. Um, so things like, including things like um, dyslexia, so neurodiversity as well. Now, in the geosciences, if we are really, if we really think about it, um, have we always been a home for people who have visible disabilities? I know that when I studied both my bachelor's and my master's, there was nobody who had a physical um, disability at all in those classes. And even in the workplace, um, I think there are few and far between. But I've shown you some LIDAR from SLOCHT, and I've, I've said that we were able to use that to gather um, geological data. We were able to do that, use that to do mapping and what have you. So why can we not have more people with disabilities working in geoscience, working in engineering? Again, we just need to change our mindset a little bit and be a, a bit more inclusive and open-minded in how we um, recruit people and how we encourage people into those subjects at university as well. And the last slide in this group here is that we've got a lack of BAME, so Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic representation in the geosciences. Now this slide, um, just for clarity, this is the population overall, so it's a breakdown um, for students and it's this column here that's geoscience specifically. So we can see that really we aren't attracting um, a representative number of people from these backgrounds into these subjects. Why? We need to think about that. We need to start addressing that moving forwards because there's absolutely nothing about your racial background that would stop you from being a geoscientist at all, really. And again, these are people whose skills that we need and we need those different ways of thinking as we move forward and as we develop the major infrastructure projects of the future. Now, there are 
a lot of barriers and there's a lot of really good work being done to address them. Um, so, for example, the initiative Girls into Geoscience, some of you may have heard of that. They're doing a great job at encouraging young women to move into geoscience subjects at university. Fabulous, really, really great stuff. Um, we've also got Diversity in Geoscience UK. So they are looking at things like disability in geoscience and how to make things a bit more open and welcoming for people. That's really good news. We need to start chipping away at these barriers. Now, for me, there's a couple of things that um, I think are really central to how we push this, push this diversity challenge forwards. And number one is inclusivity. We want to be a subject and we want to be a place for everybody because we need more numbers of people studying geoscience. Our talent pool um, is reducing. We are losing students who are wanting to study geoscience. That's going to have a knock on effect in my sector, in your sectors as well, moving forwards. So we need to, um, we need to adapt a little bit and make sure that everybody feels comfortable. Now, some of the things, they might sound daft to you, but they don't, they're not daft to the people they affect. So for example, some people feel a bit awkward about peeing outside. So think about field trips. We tend to have had to done that, tend to have to do that. Even some places where we work, there may not be toilet facilities. But for some people, that can be a real challenge and that becomes a barrier that stops them from going into geoscience. And really that, that should be quite a straightforward thing to start to overcome. And I know the University of Birmingham has um They've got some really good guidance around exactly that matter as well. So it just takes a bit of thought and it just takes maybe reminding one another about the challenges that we face. I guess first and foremost, we need to be talking about it. And then the next big thing for me is representation. So that was touched upon in the slide, with the, the BAME figures. We need to see people in these roles. We need to give people platforms because I really strongly believe that if you, you don't see it, you can't be it. So this starts right down at school age. If you don't see somebody who's like you, whether it's your gender, your skin color, your disability, in those roles, you don't think they're for you. So we really need to start thinking about who we push forward to do things and how we do more to promote, again, being a home for everyone. Now, the next part of my presentation is actually a subject which ties into the diversity matter because I think there are ways in which major infrastructure projects in Scotland can and already are addressing these issues. And that is great news. And one of the things I want to talk about is um, Transport Scotland's initiative Academy Now, which I'm incredibly proud to have had any involvement with actually. Now, Academy Nine is, um, to all intents and purposes, um, a STEM initiative which runs alongside the Academy Nine dueling project overall. It was set up um, in 2015 and it runs in parallel to the design and the construction of the A9 schemes. And it's a program of STEM related activities delivered to children and young people in schools and colleges along the A9 corridor. Now this initiative, um, it's a really well thought through, it's a bespoke program of annual events and that's developed in conjunction with the Knowledge Exchange Partnership. So they are uh, they're education consultants basically. And each of the A9 consultants has education liaison officers embedded into our team and helping us to deliver Academy 9 in schools. So that's fabulous, we've got different people in the workplace than we would ordinarily have in engineering consultancy. And this scheme, um, as the A9 moves forward, as we reach construction phase for some schemes, we're also drawing in contractors and it's an obligation that's placed upon people to get involved with the STEM initiative, to get involved with Academy 9. Transport Scotland view it as central to the success of the A9 programme. And really it's one of the, the few occasions when the consultants and contractors, we can actually work together as a collective. So it's just quite a different approach to the, the job that we do and quite a nice way to mix with people and deliver something so successful. And uh, one of the things I quite like is the little tagline, it's running from three to PhD. So Academy 9 has been incredibly ambitious. It's starting out with really, really little kids doing fun stuff with them, but also supporting learning at all different school levels and also beyond that, so apprenticeships, um, MSc projects, PhDs as well. You know, the, the Academy 9 hasn't felt limited. They're trying to do something and they're trying to go back and see students over successive years when they're in school as well to embed a bit more about the project. 
Now, a few facts and figures about what we've achieved, and I would note that these, rates, these are from 2015 when it started, up until when we were not able to go into schools at the start of the pandemic. Um, during that time, the, the delivery has had to switch, as you can imagine, there's been online delivery of some events, but a lot of them are quite hands-on, so we've unfortunately not been able to deliver those. But Academy 9 has kept on going, it's adapted. So in those years, there's been 223 events held in 27 schools along the corridor. And that means there's been 6,600 pupil engagements. There's also been 850 teacher engagements. So Academy 9 also runs a module for teachers to learn a bit more about this scheme so that they can help to deliver broader STEM activities in schools as well. Again, we're not just limited to kids, it's not just limited to young kids, we're including teachers in that learning also. And one thing that I think is, is a real positive of Academy 9 is that the A9 consultants, professionals like myself, we go into schools with our education liaison officer and we deliver activities. And those activities are delivered regardless of the size of school. So you can imagine some of these are rural, they're tiny little primary schools. We can do, we've delivered them. I've gone in with um, three colleagues and we've delivered to four children before. We've delivered a session with them. So it doesn't matter a big school, a small school, it's an equal opportunity. And also in the schools, we're finding that there's a real mix of abilities. That's not a barrier to us as well. We adapt as best we can. Everybody gets something from the experience and everybody gets to have that interaction with the professionals. Now, the, the initiative has been so well received, it actually won this award in 2018. And since 2018, it's sort of, it, it just keeps on growing. Academy 9 has actually had a conference which was held in Abbey Moor, and that was for education practitioners to learn more about the scheme, more about um, other STEM initiatives, and just generally about what we can do to foster an environment um, where STEM subjects are desirable for young people. And as I mentioned before, now we're moving into construction phase, we're getting the experience of contractors and we're understanding what they might like to do with schools and young people, what learning they would like to offer. So it's bringing a different flavour um, to kids as well. Now this little slide here, um, this is a bit of an overview. I asked for a list of all of the disciplines which are involved in the delivery of Academy 9 activities. And this is a list that I received from Transfer Scotland. I actually think they're underselling themselves. I think other disciplines have been engaged. But for me, this is quite fun because are we looking at, I mean, I like to think we're looking at lots of geologists of the, of the future along the A9 corridor. Are we looking at health and safety advisors? These children have got a great opportunity to, to learn about jobs, learn about possibilities. And very often, they, you know, they get asked at the end of a session, would you like to be a whatever it could be? And sometimes it's a resounding no, but who cares? That's great, at least they've heard about it. That's the main thing, because I know when I was at school, I certainly hadn't heard of an engineering geologist, for example. So it's just, it's so delightful to see, um, to imagine the future possibilities of, of what our workforce could look like moving forwards. And I think that one thing that's um, particularly good about Academy 9 is that it's a structured program. There's a real um, strategy to, del to delivery and it's encompassing all different age groups and it's aligned with the curriculum. Now, I'm a big believer, if you can go into a school and give a careers talk, run a STEM session, wonderful. I think everything helps. But when we can have something that's a bit more tailored and a bit more structured, that's surely only to greater benefit looking ahead as well, because it's really helping to support the education practitioners and their delivery and to meet their needs also. So there's just a lot that we can learn from Academy 9. Now there's a huge number of different activities. I'm gonna to touch upon the Academy 9 Roadshow because that's what I help to deliver. And it's this is um, targeted at primary six children. So um, still, still appear to say a bit kiddish sometimes, but getting to be quite grown up. So they're, they're still keen to get their hands mucky and have a bit of fun, um, but sometimes a bit reluctant and a bit too grown up at first. Now in the Roadshow, we bring um, three professionals into the school. That's a civil engineer, so the image on the left hand side of the screen, that's the civil engineering task that we run. And this is actually um, looking at journey times along our road and constraints to developing a road. And really ultimately this boils down to a maths task. Um, so it's interesting, some people absolutely whiz through it, others um, it takes a little bit longer to sink in. 
So at the end of the day, they're learning a little bit about civil engineering and they're getting to do something which some of them really enjoy. I was never a big maths fan at school, so I'm not sure I would have done this quite the same. Um, the middle image is the task that's, de that's delivered by an ecologist. And this is actually, I think, my favourite of the three. Um, because in this one, the, the, the children learn about various ecological matters. They learn some new words, like an otter's home is a, a halt, for example. Um, but actually, this task concludes with the children having to make a decision about which side of the road they would widen to, noting that there's impacts whichever way they go. So you might lose some woodland or you might be crossing a river, for example. Maybe there's some houses that could be affected. So it starts to get the kids to really use their problem solving skills and just more generally contextualize this kind of activity and understand about the, the thinking that goes into it and the challenges that go into it. Um, yeah, I think it's, I, I'm a, a huge fan of the ecology task. It's, it's also great fun to take part in. And the image on the right hand side of the screen, this is the geology task. And this is the one that I deliver. So the, the children in this situation, they are learning about three different material types. We've got a special Academy 9 rock, which is in the foreground there. It's plaster of Paris. So I don't like to give the game away too early. Um, we have clay, which is real clay collected from the ground. And we've also got sand and gravel. And the children are really encouraged to, with gloves on, um, get their hands into the materials, think about describing words, understanding what they're like. And it's quite an interactive task. And then we ask questions about, well, how might you go about investigating the ground? What would you do? And of course, the obvious thing is you, you dig a hole and there's spot on right. You do a borehole, something like that. And we take it to the next step. You'll see these, are, there are colorful bits of wood which are in the boxes on the screen there. And this is all about getting the children to think about, if you were going to build a bridge on each of these three materials, what type of support might you use for your bridge? We've got a big chunky block, a sort of middle-sized block, and one you can't see, which is a dowel, basically. And the principle is that if you use the chunky block on the clay, for example, you're not going to sink into the clay, whereas the little skinny dowel will just scoot all the way through. And the rock, you could use all three. All three would stand up. So it's about thinking lots of good describing words, um, lots of questions about how they would go about investigating this in real life, and then thinking about, well, where's the connection with the engineering? Where's the connection with the A9 as well? So it's, I mean, it is great fun. You can imagine the classroom tends to be a riot once the clay gets out and the sand and gravel gets loose as well. But um, by and large, I think everybody enjoys it. And the teachers, they play a really important part in this as well. The, the day that we go into school is bookended by a session beforehand. So an introduction to the A9, a little bit about the task, tasks. And then there's a session that the teachers deliver afterwards. And the teachers are, are wonderful. They're great. Um, we appear and cause havoc for a few hours, but they're always really gracious and they really seem to enjoy having us there, which is lovely. Now, it's not just the children and the young people who are really benefiting from delivery of these STEM activities. It's also our professionals as well. There's, there's a, an added benefit. If you're a graduate, for example, what a great opportunity to go out to schools and present to people because presenting can be difficult. Not everybody is a natural. Not everybody has those skills and they need to learn them. So we need to think about, yes, we're going in, we're helping a local community. We're encouraging children to think about STEM options in school and in careers thereafter. But also, it's a really great way for our young professionals to develop their own soft skills also. So that's a big plus for me as well as a line manager. Now, Transport Scotland are, are thinking really carefully about how they measure the success of Academy 9. And that's one thing that maybe isn't quite there yet. They're looking at how they can collect data. And ultimately, they want to be able to ask young people, you know, has an Academy 9 activity influenced your choice of subject, your choice of career, your choice of college, university subject, anything like that. So they're looking at how they can go about collecting that information now. Um, and I think that that's actually going to be quite an interesting exercise and a long term exercise as well. I, I would like to think that there will be a positive impact and we will see an uptake in STEM subjects, but who can say? At least they're aware of them. Now, one thing that I, I've, I've used the phrase STEM throughout all of this, but this is a challenge to myself as well here. Should we be talking about STEAM? So science, technology, arts, engineering and mathematics. Because actually, us as geoscientists, my colleagues as engineers, 
there's creative thinking involved in each of these disciplines. And actually an initiative like the A9 opens up opportunities to think about more artistic uses of the scheme, of the scheme more artistic uses of um, engaging children with it. So for me, that's something that I would like to see perhaps improving and increasing over time is introducing a bit more of an arts element because actually they are all linked and they're all interchangeable skills that help ultimately in the long term. Um, and certainly for, for geoscience, I mean, we make interpretations that that is creative thinking as well, using the data that we have to then interpret it and take it a bit forward. So it's all, all good stuff and we should be doing more of it. So, uh, like I say, I feel like I've rattled through things, so sorry about that, but I've touched upon a couple of schemes. I've touched upon, as Graham mentioned, I'm quite passionate about the diversity side of things. Um, and I think that we could do more to create an inclusive culture and, and get the people that we want into geoscience. And I think that Academy 9 is a really good example of ways that we can capture the imagination of people from a really young age. And, and if we've got that inclusive environment, we will keep those people to university and into the work stream thereafter. So the conclusions for me are, are, are really pretty simple. These big infrastructure projects, the, the A9s of the world, they're an opportunity to develop strategic STEAM projects and programs in schools. And these programs are an opportunity to improve representation of minority groups. So for example, a woman standing up talking about engineering in a school you know, that, that in itself, that's a representation of a minority group. One of the interesting things is that the kids often get asked, who of the three do you think is the engineer? And they will point to a boy. They always do. They point to a man. Um, so we do need to challenge that. And this improved representation, it really does have the potential to increase participation. Because if you see people doing something, there's something to mirror and emulate moving forward. There's people to speak to about their experiences. And that increased participation will absolutely um, lead to having a stronger and more resilient industry resource pipeline. And we need that pipeline so that we can successfully deliver these amazing infrastructure projects that we have in Scotland. I've included a few little QR codes here. Um, one takes you to Transport Scotland's page about the A9 dueling. One takes you to SSE's page about Corrie Glass. The diversity in geoscience link is actually to the Joel Sox um, Geoscientist magazine. There was a good edition earlier this year touching upon some of the diversity issues. And I've included one for Academy 9. I would really recommend the Academy 9 one. It, it leads you directly to the Roadshow page. And there's some really fun videos showing the activities being delivered in schools. So if you've got time to whip your phone out and scan one of these QR codes, please do go for it. But really, other than that, all that remains is for me to say thank you very much. Thank you for listening. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you tonight and hopefully I'll be able to do something similar in real life sometime soon as well. So thank you very much. <laughs>